Hello everyone. So we are still in chapter 9, which is looking at developmental psychology, and we are now in my favorite part, which is adolescent psychology. And it's looking at essentially teenagers and just what's going on during that time in our life. And so, as always, if we look at the review guide, there's actually only three things um, that we're going to be covering as far as the exam is concerned. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff, and I might go on a very small little tangent for a few of them, but I'm going to try to contain myself. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. And so we are now in module 9.4, adolescence. And the very first thing, when you think about adolescence, people always say puberty um, and the various physical developments that come with it. Uh, and so that is, for the most part, how we categorize um adolescence is it is the beginning of puberty um, is what usually starts off adolescence and you'll see just by looking at this uh, that the majority of the time females um, which is the blue line start to go into puberty a little bit before males uh, which is the green line um, and of course this is looking at height and this is why there is a, a time in school where the majority of the time the females are much taller than the males, and it's because they're going through puberty quicker. And when we look at puberty, uh, essentially what happens is when boys mature earlier, there's a lot of positive things. So they're taller and stronger quicker, so they have an advantage in sports. They're likely to have a better positive body image, feeling more confident and secure and independent. Um, they tend to be more successful academically. And again, a lot of that just comes from the confidence that they have uh, through going through maturation or the beginning of maturation sooner. Um, however, they can also be more hostile and aggressive because they are learning to deal with a higher increase in testosterone. And they can sometimes have problems in, uh, with substance abuse later on. Um, in their adolescence. But overall, when you look at, you know, what research says for boys that mature earlier than expected, um, it tends to be positive. Females, on the other hand, um, it tends to be the opposite. So females that go through puberty sooner um, tend to be self-conscious or dissatisfied with their bodies. Um, they're more likely to vet to develop eating disorders, um, have earlier sexual experiences or unwanted pregnancies, and may be exposed to drugs or alcohol more often. Um, and so it kind of shows that for those, and again, overall, uh, girls go into puberty before boys, but if girls go into puberty even sooner than other girls, um, it is found that there are more negative effects to it than if boys go through puberty before other boys. Um, so just food for thought. Um, and so that was kind of more just body image and things like that, but there's also cognitive development. Uh, and Piaget, again, huge name in cognitive uh, psychology, believed that this was marked by the formal operation stage, which we talked about very briefly in the last module. They also, he also believed, sorry, that egocentrism came back, which again is just this focus on the self, um, not really realizing that, you know, other people are going through other things. It's kind of more, you know, just all the things that are going on with you, which makes sense because adolescence, crazy time. Um, but there's also these other two theories um, or uh, different characteristics of adolescence, and there is the imaginary audience and the personal fable. Um, and the personal fable is the one that you need to know for the exam, but I'm also going to talk about imaginary audience a little because this is huge. And imaginary audience is the whole idea that during adolescence, adolescents feel as though they are on a stage and everyone is watching them. And so, you know, if they have a zit on their face or, you know, they feel like their hair doesn't look the way that it should or, you know, they feel like the clothes that they wear, they don't like the way it looks. They feel like everybody is watching them and judging them. And so they feel very self-conscious. And this is something you see a lot of times in adolescence. And this goes into, and I'm going to bring myself back a little bit. Um, but this goes into one of the rants that I always want to talk about with my students because they are adolescents. 
And it is something that you, well, a lot of individuals discover later on in life. And it always sounds really weird. Um, but it's something that once you discover it, ugh, it makes life so much easier. And that is the fact that, and don't take it out of context, but that people don't care about you. And what I mean by that is that strangers don't care about you or what you're doing uh, the majority of the time, unless it like personally affects them. And so this goes against the whole idea of the imaginary audience. And the example that I always like to give is public speaking or speaking in front of class um, or, you know, speaking in front of fellow students or your peers in class. And a lot of times people are terrified about it because they feel like, you know, if they mess up, if they say something wrong, if they choke on their words, everyone's going to laugh at them and, you know, they're going to embarrass themselves. But I can guarantee that whenever you are doing class presentations in front of class, everybody else in that room is more focused on their own presentation. And they're worried, you know, they're sitting there, you know, waiting for their chance to speak in front of class. And, you know, then they're worried what other people are going to be thinking and, you know, if they mess up and all of that. And so because, and this goes into the egocentrism, because your peers and other adolescents are so busy worrying about themselves and how they're going to come across, they could care less what you're doing. Um, and this follows through into like adulthood. Um, when you do certain things, you mess up, you know, yeah, maybe someone will laugh. But, you know, the next day, it's history. They don't remember it. Um, and so realizing that, you know, people that you don't know really could care less if you, you know, mess up a word or do something like that um, is something that hits later on in life. And it's a wonderful thing to realize that, you know, you can embarrass yourself and make mistakes and it's fine. And most people don't care and the people that do care aren't worth your time. Um, so it's something that I always like to share um, th that goes into something that a lot of adolescents go through where they're so worried about what other people think about them, which then affects how they think about themselves, and it, it's not necessary. Um, so that's the imaginary audience. Again, sorry that I went a little bit um, into a tangent. The other thing is a personal fable, and that is what you will need to know on the exam. And the personal fable, again, goes into what I was saying in kind of this egocentrism, where you feel like you are the main character in a story, which in a sense you are, you are the main character of your own story. But because we view ourselves as the main character, a lot of times we don't realize that things can happen to us that usually don't happen to the main character. So in a lot of movies, you know, they go against these huge odds, you know, tons of enemies or, you know, things that would kill most people, but the main character makes it through somehow. And so we have this idea that because we're the main character, because we are, you know, ourselves and this is our story that's being written, we tend to have this feeling that, you know, things don't happen to us, it happens to other people. So like getting into a car accident, um, getting pregnant, um, you know, getting certain diseases, you know, just anything that you know can happen, there's a part in the back of your head that feels like it's not going to happen to you. And so that's why a lot of times, like if you get into like a car accident or, you know, you have an unwanted pregnancy, a lot of times the first thing they say is like, I can't believe this is happening. Even though when you look back, it's like, oh, you weren't, you know, practicing proper driving etiquette or, you know, not wearing protection, stuff like that. Like, you know that there was a chance, but it feels like it shouldn't have happened. Um, and that's the personal fable, uh, which you will need to know for the exam. So it's this whole idea that you believe that you're like special, the main character of your own story, and therefore things won't happen to you. Um, that's personal fable. Oops. Um, and then we go into moral reasoning. Uh, and this you had as your journal entry for today. So I'm only going to go into kind of the results of it and not the thing itself. But this was done by Kohlberg. And Kohlberg looked into our moral reasoning, how we define right and wrong, what do we use as our moral compass. Um, and Kohlberg believed that, just like many other uh, psychologists out there, it happened in stages. And so this is what your journal entry was. You did the Heinz Dilemma, 
Um, though it was written in kind of a, a shorter form. This is the actual one from 1969. And it was this whole story, again, you had this as a journal entry, um, but it was this husband, Heinz, who had a dying wife. And the only way, you know, he did everything that he could, um, but the only way that he could potentially help her was with this drug that this doctor was charging way too much for. And so he broke into the store to steal the drug. And then the question that I asked you for the journal entry was, should Heinz have done this? And then more importantly, why do you say yes or no? So what is your reasoning as to why you said yes or no? And Kohlberg believed that depending on how you answer it, um, you fell into one of three different stages of moral development. So the very first one is the pre-conventional. And this is one of the ones that you will need to know for the exam. And it's a whole idea that your moral compass or how you decide right from wrong has to do with physical consequences. So this goes back to when we talked about reinforcement and punishments. It's just looking at if you're going to get rewarded for something or if you're going to get punished for something. Um, and so you see this a lot of time with children. So like, would you steal a cookie from the cookie jar? A child would say no, because then, you know, I'd get in trouble or yes, because then I'd have a cookie. It's all about rewards or punishments. Um, so that's the pre-conventional. Next one is the conventional, which you will also need to know for the exam. And the conventional one is pretty much just the fear of the law. So pre-conventional is fear of punishment. Conventional is fear of the law. So it's this whole idea that your moral compass is based on the rules that are out there. Um, so, you know, no, I shouldn't steal a cookie from the cookie jar because stealing is wrong. It's just a matter of, you know, what rules are out there, you know, because my mom said that I shouldn't steal the cookie. Um, going back to the Heinz dilemma, well, I'll we'll do the Heinz dilemma in the next one. Um, and then the very last one is the post-conventional. And this is more a weighing moral alternative. Essentially what that means is you're above the law morally. You are deciding for yourself right from wrong. And sometimes it doesn't match up with what the law says. Uh, more you are deciding for yourself. And so as far as the Heinz dilemma is concerned, um, and each of these levels can be broken down into stages, um, but for the sake of this class, again, we just kind of talk about each of the level, you'll see um, the different reasoning for why people would say why Heinz should steal the drug versus why he should not. And so again, it's not so much if you answer yes or no to the Heinz dilemma, it's more the reasoning why. So again, the pre-conventional is more about the fear of punishment. So again, you know, he would be punished for stealing um, or he would be blamed if his wife died. So again, it's all about just punishment, being blamed, things like that. Um, the conventional is more for the law. So others will see him as a criminal um, because that's, you know, the way that society defines it um, or he would lose people's respect. So again, it's more the law and also you know, society, what society says is right and wrong. And then finally, the post-conventional, again, it's when you are kind of above the law, you are deciding for yourself. So again, though laws should be obeyed, um, an exception is being made um, to protect a human life. So yes, there are rules, but sometimes they are broken. Um, it's kind of the thought for the post-conventional. Then we get back to Eric Erickson. Um, as I mentioned in the last chapter, um, we're going to keep coming back to him, and he thinks that there's different crises. And so the psychosocial development, which was Eric Erickson, um, believed that in adolescence, the crisis was identity versus role confusion. And it was this whole idea of figuring out who you are and what you're going to do with your life. And he believed that if you did not successfully get through this stage uh, during adolescence, you would have you wouldn't have a clear sense of who you were, where you were heading. You would be, you know, what it says for drifting. Um, and this is where I get into my second little rant. So I'm bringing myself back um, because this is when I disagree with Eric Erickson. Um, and I know that that is biased, and I apologize. This is a bit of my biased opinion. But when Eric Erickson was coming up with these stages, the ideas of what was expected when in a person's life were different. 
um, back then when these stages were being developed, it was a whole idea that, you know, in adolescence, um, you're figuring out who you are, then you get married, then you have kids. Um, there were very set, uh, I shouldn't say set rules, but set expectations um, for individuals. And I think that that is sometimes a disservice that we do to adolescents when we are expecting them to know who they are. Because one thing that I always say is that adolescence is such a fun time, especially later adolescence, um, when you're getting into an adulthood, because it's the first time that you're really starting to think and wonder who you are. When you're a child, yeah, it, you know, there's this idea of, ooh, when I grow up, I want to be this, I want to be that. But there isn't as much of this abstract thinking. And so when you get that abstract thinking, then you can start thinking more about who you want to be in this world, you know, the long-term plans. And so you shouldn't know that soon who you are if you're just starting to explore it. Um, that being said, there should be a potential path, like, you know, figuring out, okay, what kind of things do I enjoy? You know, this is the time of your life to explore those paths and to have a rough idea, but to not have it set in stone. Um, so one thing that I always like to tell adolescents, especially in high school, is if you don't know who you are, if you don't know what you want to do with your life yet, that is fine. It does not mean that you're falling behind. Um, you're just figuring out who you are for the first time. Um, once you're 18, you can start doing things. You have that freedom to kind of pick for yourself. That's the time when you should be figuring out who you are. And even with that being said, you know, we have found that you are a completely different person, you know, later on in life. As you continue to develop, you continue to change, and you become a different person. And again, that is fine. Um, so I always want to just take a little side note when we talk about this. And yes, this tends to be what is weighing on the mind of a lot of adolescents, is figuring out who they are. But I disagree when it gets to the idea of... If you don't, you have this kind of drifting where you lack this clear set of values and directions. And while that is true for some adolescents, that shouldn't be seen as a bad thing. It just means that you're still figuring out who you are. And that is fine. Take your time, explore new things um, legally and safely, um, and figure out who you are. Enjoy the journey of figuring out who you are. Anyway, sorry. Uh, that is my last rant for this, I swear. Um, but just to know that that is the kind of crisis that Eric Erickson uh, believed that adolescents were going through. Um, and then one final thing. Again, another thing that I love. I love adolescent psychology, but I also like cyber psychology. But there's something very interesting that is happening um, with kind of adolescents now. Um, and it was affecting kind of children, you know, years prior. And it's this whole idea of the digital age, that when I was growing up, there wasn't as much of a digital presence. But nowadays, technology is everywhere. You can reach your friends immediately. Um, you know, everything that you do is recorded. Um, and so the things to take away from this, because I don't want this to be too long, is there are positives and negatives. There are pros and cons. The pros are that you have this access to communicating with so many new individuals that might be going through things similar to you. Uh, you can reach your friends so much quicker, and there's so much access to knowledge. Um, but the cons are that with the access to so much knowledge, there's also all this access to inaccurate knowledge or inaccurate um, data or sayings and all sorts of stuff. And also, there's increased risk um, with interacting with people online. You can meet people very similar to you, but there's always this added risk that that person might not truly be who they say they are. So it's very interesting to see how people are developing and changing psychosocially because of this digital age. Um, and this goes into this whole field of psychology known as cyber psychology, which is one of the fields that I'm very interested in. Um, but it's food for thought. Again, if there is time, I'll be doing my own lecture on this. And so that is it for the adolescent part of uh, development. And so, as always, if I bring up the review, 
there was just three things that you needed to know for this one. I know I know I went on two little rants, I apologize, but it's stuff that I think is important um, to communicate with adolescents. But the first thing to know is personal fable, and this is the whole idea that, again, you are the main character of your own story. You are kind of the centerpiece, and therefore, you know, you're kind of impervious to things. Um, you know, you feel like you're at the center of the world, um, and therefore things can't happen to you. That's personal fable. Uh, we then get to this idea of pre-conventional and conventional moral development. Pre-conventional is when it's just kind of fear of punishment. It's just rewards, punishments. That is your moral motivator. Conventional uh, moral development is then when it's fear of the law. It is you do what society says is right and wrong. Um, and that's all that you really need to know for the exam. Um, but again, I know I went into a little bit more. Again, I love adolescent psychology. It's why I love being a high school teacher and a college teacher, um, mainly working with freshmen. Um, but those are the things to know. We will have one more lecture uh, when we cover adulthood, both early, middle, and late.